Hi, Tyler. How are you today? I'm doing really good, Jenna. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Tyler, did you get our email that we sent around to our team about open enrollment to everyone? Did. Yes, yes. And everything is completed on my end. <laughs> good. We're happy for that. So I'm getting some questions and I actually, so we're going to do this for our, our prospects, our clients, but I also want to do this for our team as well, because our team has been asking about, so obviously it's open enrollment and health insurance time that also talks about life insurance if people need to up their classes, things of that nature. And so I want to do this for our team as well as the clients and prospects, but I want to talk about, because I've heard you say this multiple times to um, your clients that you work with, and I've even seen you do webinars on it is utilizing life insurance as an asset class, which is kind of a weird sentence, not normally talked about, but I love the idea of it. And I'd love for you to go into more information of what that means and yeah. how our team and or clients can use that for the future. Yeah, I think that life insurance is one of the most missed, misunderstood investments that are out there for most people, right? It has, in some cases, uh, as it should, right? Rightfully so, if used improperly, can be really expensive. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, that's an insurance salesman. They're pushing away. So uh, life insurance really can be broken down into multiple levels. The first thing that it's there for is insurance is simply a tool to protect you and your loved ones. So if yeah. you know you or, your, you or your spouse passed away at a young age, your house can get paid off, your kids can go to college, you know, things can get paid off that allow your family to continue to maintain the same lifestyle or protection that they had previously. That's, that's the first piece of the life insurance planning. And that's where most people hone in on. But there's so much more than that, right? When you start okay. to look it's into clean. the nuances of what life insurance can provide is when you get to a certain level, life insurance opens up another avenue of looking for tax efficient or very tax mm. efficient income streams. So it allows right. you to be able to pull income from something and pay a reduced amount of tax if done properly, right? Uh, based on what you have in either cash balance, what you paid into the policy, but taking it a step further than that, what it does is it starts to unlock your nest egg. And that's the mm, key word that okay. most people don't think about. So uh, the average person, let's say that you've you've worked for 30, 40 years and you've built up a million dollars of uh, of your nest egg, whether it's, you know, a, a joint investment account, a 401k, you name it. Right. You have a million dollars of assets that you've built up. Well, most people say, well, I'm going to draw five percent of that million dollars and I want to leave that, you know, leave the principal or the lion's share of that amount left over for the next generation or for my kids. Well, 5% of a million bucks, you're, you're looking at $50,000. So here you mm -hmm. saved and saved and saved and you got to a million, but you never really get to unlock that million. You're pulling the 5% or the interest yeah. that's generated on the million for yourself. If used properly and why I call, you know, life insurance its own asset class is if you start to plan for it, where you're building it, where you know that there's a million dollars that's gonna come tax-free to your beneficiaries okay. when you pass, what if you spent the full million that you had? I think people right? love that. Exactly, you unlock the potential and gave yourself the freedom to spend more and you could theoretically okay. spend down the full million in that example that you've saved and okay. still leave a million dollars left over for your kids, right? So okay. you've heard me say on previous podcasts, not all dollars are created equal, right? There's pre-tax yeah. money, mm -hmm. and then there's after-tax money. Life insurance for most individuals is paid after tax, meaning you pay no taxes when you receive the life insurance proceed. So okay. most of the baby boomers wealth out there is in their 401ks or IRAs. That money is pre-tax. When you pass away mm -hmm. and your kids inherit that asset, they're going to have to pay taxes, ordinary income, on that over a 10-year period in most cases. So their tax bracket shoots up exponentially, meaning they take the distribution out, but they're actually getting a fraction of that amount because they have to pay Uncle Sam the taxes that are due on that money. Now, I ask that same question, if planned for properly, wouldn't you rather leave them a million dollars of tax-free money versus a million dollars of taxable money? And the answer mm -hmm. is typically yes, 
right? It mm -hmm. also allows you to have the ability to spend more of that money when you may be in a lower income or tax bracket than what your kids will be if they're forced to spend a million dollars over 10 years. So there's a lot right. of conversations that go to, into this. And the reason I call life insurance its own asset class is because you can't just put it into whatever piece of the plan that it falls into because there's so many intricacies, you have to right. have a conversation about it. So whether mm -hmm. it's somebody passing away at a young age and you're just looking to insure risk, mm -hmm. that's one piece. That's step one. Step two is you may be looking for another way to draw income and not pay as much to Uncle Sam. That's a great vehicle to look at. Step three, mm -hmm. you might have a small business and you're saying, I'd like to put more money away pre-tax. That's a fantastic option for that. And then you get into the legacy piece for that next generation and the tax strategies behind that. There is a place for it in each of those but each one is treated differently. So it is its separate asset, its own separate asset class, I should say, whenever you're having that conversation. Okay. So I'm gonna ask a follow-up question. This is more geared towards our team, is that if you have insurance through your company, would you recommend utilizing that avenue or would you recommend going externally to a third party like you just mentioned? Or both, really I guess, question. is an option. Really good question. So. Uh, group life insurance is the cheapest, easiest way to get coverage. Most places you're not even required to get a physical up to a certain amount of coverage. So if a client is in that step one uh, where they're looking to just get insurance to help cover their kids. So let's say that their kids are uh, 17 and 18 years old and mm -hmm. they're looking to retire maybe 10 years from now from that company and right. they might be 60 years old it's pretty expensive to go get a policy somewhere when you're 60 years old, True. right? Sure. Hey, mm -hmm. let's sign up for a group policy through work for let's say $250,000 that might cost you eight or $9 a paycheck. You don't have to have a physical and it's, it's group term is only term. It's insurance until you're no longer employed. Once you're no longer employed, it goes away. So in that example, right. if you need insurance till your kids are 24 and out of college, well, you plan on retiring in 10 years, you're still with the company, that's six years worth of coverage, you're covered, right? That's a great yep. way to get a lower cost option for insurance. When you start sense. to get into the more intricacies of insurance planning, typically that cannot be solved through group term insurance. You have to go okay. elsewhere. And now some okay. group employees some employers have contacts they can help with, but no, typically you're working with more of a, uh, you know, what we would call an insurance strategist where you're laying out different mm -hmm. options and saying, what do we need to do and why? And there is a lot of planning that uh, is involved with those steps. Well, that's good information. That's great underlying like starting points too, uh, as well. So I do appreciate that. And so what are the next steps then if someone does want to go the route towards working with a strategist or working with a financial advisor? What are the first steps for that? They Do they reach out financial advisor first? Or they reach out to the um, insurance strategist? How do they typically do that? Well, there's certain people that can be both right? It, where they're really That's fair, uh, they're yeah. doing a holistic plan and looking at all. Like if, if a client were to come to us, what you're looking at is you're saying, what are the goals? And then how do we get mm -hmm. there with the solutions, right? What's the most efficient way to engineer the plan for what the client is looking for? Uh, once we know those pieces, then you can start to put all the dominoes in a line to say, hey, we're lining everything up to get you to your end goal. And this is why, not only this is why it's most, afford, uh, most efficient, but I can show you the dollar amounts of the tax savings you're going to have at certain ages to prove that it's more efficient. That's the biggest piece mm -hmm. is in theory, everything mm -hmm. sounds great. Yep. But let's run the most conservative estimation possible and still see if they're savings, right? Now we know that it, the proof is in the, the actual details that are there. So uh, step one is you have a conversation about it with your advisor, right? This okay. is what I'm looking for. Okay. If they're completely um, blindsided, like, no, this is, we're going to keep doing this and we're going to keep doing this strategy, and they're not open to having the conversation probably means you, you need to start having a conversation with maybe a different advisor or uh, start to, to possibly bring another opinion into the fold because mm -hmm. all you're doing is educating yourself about what's best for you. That's it, right? right. The door should right. never be shut. Now, there's certain times I tell clients like, no, you do not want to do this. It does not make financial sense. There's absolute times. Right. But what you want to see is the why. And that's the biggest piece is this is what you're currently mm -hmm. doing. This is more efficient than this because of X, right? We have this conversation all the time with clients about, you know, Roth conversions. And I say, 
you know, all you're looking at with Roth conversions is, is taking pre-tax money, paying taxes on it now, so mm -hmm. you don't have to pay taxes on it later or your kids don't have to pay taxes on it later. If you're 80 years old, it's very difficult to find the math that actually works to do a Roth conversion yep. and have it make sense during your lifetime. And I'll tell them that. So mm -hmm. if, if you're worried about your kids not paying taxes, this is a great option. If you're not and you're looking to save taxes, this is not a good option, right? But you can show in the numbers to educate them. It's the same thing with the insurance piece. Right. Okay. Okay. That makes perfect sense. All right. Well, thank you. I do appreciate that insight and that information. And I love like the first next steps, depending on where you're at in the process and everyone's at a different spot too. So thank you, Tyler. We do appreciate that. And reach out to us if you guys have any questions or comments. Thanks. Thanks, Jenna. Appreciate it.